Well, let's uh, <clears throat> let's roll here. So today we're um, we this can happen any number of ways. If it, it, it's a Q and A, but I also have some stuff sort of lined up in case nobody answered any asked any questions. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we can keep this one pretty casual. Like if anybody has sort of stuff they're trying to troubleshoot or, you know, they have questions about bigger picture training stuff or whatever, anything goes. Um, yeah. So anybody uh, got something off the bat? I, I have a question. I oh, like, good. oh, sorry. I just, I don't, I don't know what to like, do with myself in general now that there is no races for the foreseeable future like how do you i know it's like it's like an existential crisis really but like do you have any thoughts on that just in a general sense of like yeah it's so hard it's so hard and you're not alone i mean everybody's feeling it as well and i think i mean there's a, a couple different things i i keep kind of going back to one is that you know we're we're so used to having our the the start lines are like goals, right? They shape the whole season. They they give us a target. They they really direct all of our action. So not only physically but mentally as well. They just they provide you with the motivation to actually do it. And if you don't have that, it can be really tough. So I think there's a couple of different options. The first is that you can set up a challenge for the summer. So uh, as some examples, like, you know, one of, one of the people I know is doing that, that, like an Everest challenge. So they're, they're doing vertical gain of Everest in a day. Uh, for those of you in Vancouver there, you know, this person's doing it on Mount Seymour. Uh, <laughs> so that's, that's 10 reps of Seymour and she figures it'll take about 15 to 16 hours. And so there's an example of so like, she's super excited. She's super keen. Um, and basically everything she's going to do between now and end of July is, is directed to that. Um, so you can have that kind of a challenge. That'd be the, the first thing. The second is that, um, you know, it, it's hard right now to predict when there will be definite start lines. I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, even though they, they are announcing sort of a fall schedule, I'm, I don't know. And it's the, the biggest reason is, you know, if people go to certain places and they have to quarantine for 14 days when they get there, or they're going to have to do the same when they get home. So if you're from here and you go somewhere and then come back, are you going to want to spend, you know, two weeks quarantined after? So I'd be, I'm skeptical that there'll be a fall Ironman schedule, even though they have one, if I'm just being realistic. Um, and I'm, I'm as skeptical that a February uh, Kona is going to happen. I, I just don't, I don't know. I don't know how you're going to pull that off. And is Kona like an Island going to want 10,000 people from all over the world landing on their shores? I I mean, Kelly, you, you, you're shaking your head. You're in the medical community. So you probably know the answers. Probably no. I think no. I, I honestly like just looking at numbers and stuff. And I've been chatting with one of my friends who's like, she works for Fraser Health, but she's a PhD in epidemiology. And she's just like, oh yeah. Like just looking at numbers and whatever and stuff. Like there's going to be a second wave. It's going to be in the fall. Like it's, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. basically, <laughs> you know, with it now, I'll throw that question back at you with a second wave, given all the measures that have been taken, given the fact that borders are still closed. Does that, does that mean uh, a second wave if you've sort of, you know, if we're in BC or you're in Ontario or wherever you are, does that mean it's things are a little easier because, you know, people aren't traveling here as much or is it going to go back to what it was for May? um march march april march april like to be i mean this is not scientifically based but just the way that they're talking if if the numbers start to climb again instead of being like oh we'll put this restriction in this restriction i think if there's a second wave it's going to be like shut down because we never did a full shutdown right. and i think they will actually like they'll be like a full like that's it right. for like two weeks kind of thing and i think that that's what they'll do to try and like nip it in the butt right 
right? Kind of like New Zealand did that, didn't they? New Zealand yes. went full lockdown and they've basically wiped it out. Yep. Yep. All right. So they're good. Yep. They're kind of back and functioning. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. And they're functioning as their own like little kind of island nation with nobody else. So I, I think if we get, if we get uh, a second wave, they're going to do like full, full blown shutdown, I think. Right. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, that doesn't go back to your question. Yeah. <laughs> I think you can either, you know, set up a personal goal that's meaningful to you. That's challenging mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, I think like a race, it should scare you a little bit um, so that you're motivated. So that's one strategy. The other is just to, you know, the, the more, purest sense of it is just to train for the sake of training because you like to be fit and that one's more vague it's a little bit harder to wrap your head around it i i'm using the example lionel sanders to me is a great example for people who might follow him on social media he's just you know he it's almost like he could care less if if races are happening he's he just loves pushing himself and again it's tough right because a big reason that most people do these things is for that kind of end goal for the start line, the finish line, the energy around a race, the, you know, the, the, the excitement of traveling somewhere. And so with that taken away, you kind of have to really, I, I think you have to find new motivators. It's a, it's an opportunity to, uh, to find, you know, to discover an intrinsic motivation for, I think the real value of sport, which is just pushing yourself and, being fit and, and having structure, like those are all the reasons that, you know, at a deeper level, I think we do these things. Um, and so there's an opportunity there, but I, I'm not going to pretend that it's not hard. You know, it's, it's hard to be motivated if all of the reasons you were doing this in the first place were like, okay, I got this event, it's in 12 weeks and, and here we go it's a hard one to answer. I think everybody has to find their own, uh, motivation, uh, and figure out what that is. So if that's a challenge for you, like that, you set something up. Another example, I have uh, a woman that wants to try and break the, the age group, uh, record for an hour on the bike. So, you know, like the hour time trial. So she's, she's in her fifties and she's a great cyclist and she legitimately could do it so this is her motivation now for the summer and it's not an event she's not getting ready for an event she's got a route plan that allows her to you know it's a loop around anybody been to victoria the university of victoria has this about a mile loop i think that is like ring road which basically just goes around the university and at you know six in the morning it's vacant nobody's there well nobody's there anyway school's not really happening um but uh you know that's her that's her mission now for the for the summer so i don't know i don't know what to tell you there it's such a hard answer <laughs> those are good things to think about i appreciate that thank you yeah like i would honestly i think having some kind of a challenge is not a bad thing we're exploring the idea of just having a fun challenge that people can do at the end of the summer that on the same weekend the ironman canada would happen which is basically just an Ironman over three days. So you swim on Friday, you bike on Saturday, you run on Sunday, no placings, no times. You just, you know, you get a little finisher certificate, just something to, to point towards. Um, I don't know. We'll see. We've still got a little bit of time here. <laughs> so yeah. Good question. Hard to answer. No, it's good. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Who else has one? Who have we got on here anyway? Oh, Andy. Hey, hey, hey buddy. Hey, How are hey you? everybody. I didn't see. Uh, I didn't see in the thing. I didn't have it on gallery view. Yeah, I snuck in. He's like a yeah. gangster with his hood up. I know he uh, totally does. It's like four degrees here this morning, raining. Ah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I I have a question, Jazz. It's yeah. a light question. What letter of the alphabet are you up to with your kids on the meals? <laughs> yeah, so it has, Andy asked, what letter of the alphabet are we up to? So we've been doing letters of the alphabet for, uh, for meals, just for fun. 
And yes, last night was tea, so we had we had tacos. <laughs> Tonight is you. We have no idea who's got a you food. Like we found upside down cake, but you can't have cake for dinner. I suppose you could. <laughs> I can't think of a you food unless like urchin. I think you can get like like sushi with urchin on it, but I don't think the kids are gonna dig that. Mm -hmm. anyway you don't have to answer that but use a tricky one um but we've had lots of fun with it it's been really fun it's been really good uh, the other challenging letter was uh i forget we and, started and, it we started it but we only made it past a oh <laughs> and everyone ran out of momentum after a <laughs> We just, we started it and then everybody forgot about it. And I, for, until just now, I realized that we had, we made it to A. That's funny. You got to get a, you got to get a notepad out and yeah. plan ahead or, uh, but losing momentum after A is, you know, that's, that's not that very, that good. You didn't even have momentum. That's no, not even momentum. No momentum. <laughs> that's funny. Well, I can, I I'll take a tonight. picture. I can, I can send you our list, give you some ideas. Yeah, it is pretty fun though. The kids, the kids get into it. Jazzy, I I had to look this up, but udon noodles that starts with you. You could oh, think you get you noodles. Go. Noodles. Perfect. That's exactly what we'll do. Udon noodles. I knew there had to be something. They're good. Yeah. And then you can have upside down cake for dessert. Yes. Perfect. Awesome. I'm not that Thank creative. you. This was uh, this. I was helped by Google. Yeah. <laughs> You, that's awesome. I this is uh, very good because we were st we were legitimately stuck tonight. My kids always just want to find any pizza joint that begins with that letter. So we have Alibaba Pizza. We have so you know they, there's a every letter you can find a pizza house that has that letter. <laughs> okay, good question. Judge, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, I'm not sure how to phrase this, but just like in the context of, of as you get older as an yes. athlete. Um, so I'm in my mid forties now, which, and I don't feel like it, Yeah. but maintaining your health and staying um, injury free, which I've struggled with this year. Yes. Um, I'm wondering about, you know, just how to approach training, I guess. Because normally in the training, you've got your structured weeks, you've got your strength and all the other things everybody here is familiar with. But is it, I'm wondering whether it's worth starting to incorporate things like, um, you know, yoga and other sort of prehab kind of activities to keep the body, you know, flexible and, and uh, mobility high and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. just to avoid the injuries. So. I guess just a general thought there. I'm not sure if anyone else on the call here has experience uh, adjusting their training over the years to stay more injury free, but that's something I've struggled with over since August. Yeah, it's, that's a really good question. And it, it's, uh, it totally uh, makes sense. I mean, as we age, there's just stuff that works against us, right? Like uh, you lose muscle mass as you age, you kind of, you know, things start to go in a decline, not to make you depressed about that, but it's you just don't recover as quickly. Yes, exactly. First, you know, like when I train with Lindsay, Lindsay can do a hard workout one day and then go and do another hard workout the next day. And I can't do that anymore because mm -hmm. I'm 22 years older than her. So I like to think I'm still young, but yeah, it just takes longer and it's kind of the pits, but guess what? We're still out there doing it. Right, Andy? <laughs> uh, yeah, most days. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry yeah, to interrupt you, Jasper, but no, uh, I, I'd rather, you know what? I, I, everybody. Points of experience. I mean, you just, you have to, you have to learn to take care of yourself and make time. And I am terrible at doing yeah. that. Honestly, I talk a really good talk. Yeah. I'm going to do yoga and I'm going to do this and I'm going to roll after I run and all this stuff. And I have to consciously make an effort to do it or else I'm like, I come in the house and, Oh, I got to, do the laundry or empty the dishwasher and I don't take time. And when you don't take time, you pay the price. Your body pays the price mm. and your nutrition too. Not that Not it has right. to be perfect, but you have to be, you have to be mindful. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jasper, you mentioned Lionel, but like in his Kona video, 
he talks about doing yoga or he calls it something else like stretching or rolling but he talks about doing yoga every day since like COVID happened is that um, right yeah. yeah um Chris I take a multitude of vitamins and fish oil and certain protein powder at night I'll send you a list <laughs> oh that'd be good yeah yeah I started Yo, I want uh, your list too. <laughs> yeah send out the list Jojo, send out the list, Jojo. okay yeah. You guys may think I'm a bit weird. It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I told you, I eat. want to hear but it. I like, feel injured, so for what that's worth. No, I, I think uh, it's, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, the best advice you're going to get are from people, you know, with, with experience. And, but you mean old yeah, people? Yeah, basically, yeah. <laughs> and I, I fit into that category, too. I mean, it, you know, Joanne's totally right. You I think the, the main thing is you just have to be way more diligent with the smaller details and you can get away with more when you're younger. Not, not that you should, but you can. Um, so, you know, a couple of things that she mentioned, one is just the details of the recovery piece of it. So, you know, coming in the door and making sure you, you include maybe some rolling and light stretching or ways to, you know, prevent, you know, as part of your session. So not as, you know, an optional thing, it's now part of your session. Mm -hmm. um, the, the other thing is the, the load, uh, load and recovery are the big things we're always trying to balance. And typically if you're younger, now this sport age also has something to do with it. And sport age is how we, old we are in the sport. So you, you might be 35 years old, but you just started triathlon. So you can't handle the same load. You might be 20 years old, but you've been doing it since you were 10. So you can handle a lot of load. So understanding that relationship is important. Like how much load can I apply and how much recovery do I need in return? And typically as we get older, that ratio shifts a little bit, meaning we, we can't handle as much load and we need more recovery. Um, and those are a lot of times that's like hormonal and, you know, Kelly can maybe add to this from a medical perspective, but, uh, you know, as what I think is probably even above age 30, uh, you know, like those vital hormones that we need for recovery and for, you know, like testosterone and that kind of stuff, it, it starts to decline. It's either after age 30 or after age 40, where am I at? Kelly It's about 30, 40. Or, it's 40. 40. Yeah. So after age 40, you know, that stuff, it doesn't work in our favor anymore. Um, and those are all the things that really help uh, recovery, but also that kind of like uh, vigor and energy that we have for it in general starts to decline. So I think you just, you know, to summarize, you have to really watch the stress load versus recovery balance. And that usually needs to shift. So Instead of backing up hard workout after hard workout, you, you maybe need 48, 72 hours between those bigger sessions. doesn't mean you can't do something every day, but the really key sessions maybe need some space. Yeah. Um, one thing like that I'll sometimes do uh, with older athletes, not all the time. Again, it depends on their sport age. If they have tons of experience, you may not need to, but a lot of times with younger athletes who are doing Ironman, They'll do, you know, back to back long ride and then a long run the next day just to get used to that kind of load and running on tired legs. But sometimes, you know, I've worked with people in 60s, 70s. Sometimes if I feel like we need to, we'll split that up. So long run will happen on a Thursday and then long ride will happen on a Saturday so that we're really spreading out that load so they're not getting too overloaded. Again, depends on your your uh your sport age too like some people can still handle that no problem but sometimes just breaking up those bigger loads just gives you enough space that you can avoid injury and and just general fatigue right so, andy what are some of the things you do that that help that you've noticed i i think one of the things i found is that um i you have to be really patient with recovery um from training sessions and i'm not wired to be like that so i find that very difficult i like to do something every day um 
but I'm, I'm trying to, um, uh, I think there's a lot of value just to movement, uh, making sure that you're, you're not, if you're laying around on a couch or something, I just seize up after an hour or so. And, and, uh, so I like to, I like that feeling of being loose. Um, I'm kind of like Joanne, the yoga thing has got a lot of appeal to me. It's just been hard to kind of motivate myself to, to, uh, to do some of it, especially when you can't go to a class. Um, but it's the, um, a lot of the challenge for me over the past, say, eight or nine years has been finding out what your body can do as you get older. Um, and there's great days, there's bad days. Uh, but uh, the one thing that I haven't done yet, but I need to, is I, I think some strength training. And I've been very negligent in kind of getting on that getting on that um but it's something that looking ahead i'm 63 now so um just trying to make sure that in 10 years i'll still be able to move around and go hike or go for a ride uh, do some running um but mainly the it's more about that feeling of movement um and just your body being able to do those things and I really miss the pool right now because that's kind of the one thing I just find so nice on the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You brought up a really good one there, Andy, that I forgot to mention, which is strength or resistance training. Um, I think as we get older, this is really important, um, especially, you know, even if you're not getting ready for a long distance triathlon or something that aggressive, you know, I, I know even like, you know, my mom's, 70s 80s you know a bit of resistance training even if it's just for it's not for anything in particular other than just uh like it helps bone density it helps like just like moving weight around is is a good good for you um so i'm glad you brought that up because i forgot to mention it i think it's an important piece i think that, that one other thing that when you talk about load is that um you kind of it's it's easy to go to the fallback workouts that you really like. So if you like going for a ride or a run, and it, it takes a big mental commitment to say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do some stretching, yoga, those types of things, when really in your head you're just saying, boy, it should be nice to go ride <laughs> or, or stuff like that. So it's um, – it's a commitment and discipline to do those other things. Yeah. Um, which is a challenge. Yeah. Which is like Joanne was saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's easy to default to the, and there, I'm such a big believer in, in inertia, meaning you'll keep doing the things you're doing. It's hard to, it's hard to change direction and do something a little bit different. But then once you do it for even a couple of times, and it becomes a bit of a pattern, it's a lot easier to keep doing it. So, yeah. Massage would be another big one. You know, I think yeah. uh, m massage or even, you know, having regular preventative physio, chiro, whatever practitioners sort of resonate with you and help you stay on track, not as a, as a, like a reactive. So I'm now I'm injured. Now I'm going to go see somebody, but as a preventative, yeah. I think is important to yeah, I should do that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And now, you know, things are opening back up again, which is, which is good. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Anything I, else? I, um, to, to, just to add to this. So like at the start of May, um, Evan and I started doing this like morning yoga challenge. So we do 10 minutes of yoga every morning and I do it. Like I don't even open the door to my bedroom. Like that's the very first thing I do when I get up. So it like forces me to, to get into that habit of like, okay, I'm going to start my day doing this. Um, so I, I really like that. And it was, it's only 10 minutes, but it kind of like gets your, you know, gets your body moving. And then it also helps me figure, you know, feel how my body's feeling 
going in to a workout. So I do my 10 minutes and I notice that like my hips a little tight or whatever. And I can be mindful of that in the workout. And then like afterwards go back and stretch a little bit more or something like that. That's good. But it, now it's just a habit. Yeah. Like I do 10 minutes every morning when I wake up, no matter what. That's really cool. Is it a set routine, a real simple set routine? Same thing yeah. every time? It's so it's on YouTube. I can share the link. Um, yeah, share it. That would be great. And yeah, it's like this girl from, I think she's from Ottawa. She does 10, a 10 minute class. There is, there's like a 30 day thing where there's like day one, day two. Um, yes. through that now but she has a bunch of other like 10 minute videos that I just yeah I'd like to try that personally I, I yoga is one of those things that I don't do for a year and then I go and do it and I'm like why don't I do this more and then I do it for a bit and then I don't do it for a year <laughs> but I've had some of my most successful training blocks when I'm a regular with yoga and not 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 like when I first started going to yoga, it was like competitive yoga for me, <laughs> which you're not supposed to do, but I was, I just, I'm like, Oh, I can stretch more. I can be more flexible. And I would, you know, that was a mistake. I actually ran into some problems, but I, <laughs> I was able to go to yoga without my ego joining me at the yoga practice and just kind of being wherever I was, which was, you know, not super flexible, just, but just being where I was, you know, over time, I, I became much more uh, sort of loose with it. But also, I, I noticed a big difference in performance, I just felt better. So um, yeah, that's good. And 10 minutes appeals to me there. Mm-hmm. There are the 90 minute classes, which seem to be the norm, I really struggled with this was like a huge time commitment. Yeah. And I found a few hour classes, which were great, I could do an hour. But I found a lot of yoga studios, an hour and a half seems to be the norm. And it just seemed too much. But 10 minutes is even more appealing to me. This is great. Yeah. Or, and you can like on, on this girl's channel, there's tons on YouTube that you can search like 15 minute yoga class. And there's like 100 things that because um, I'm the same. If it's an hour, I like I 20 minutes in, I'm thinking like, oh, I should get on my bike. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, so totally. 10 minutes is kind of good. I see uh, I don't know if everybody if you just click the chat thing at the bottom you'll Lindsay posted the link there for the for the chat and everybody see that I have a question about that so then if you click on that how do you get it to how do you save it outside of the zoom chat oh so Um, if you just open the link uh uh-huh computer Uh uh-huh open the link and then you should be able to like save it into your favorites and oh, okay browser you're using gotcha i actually i just copied the link and texted it to myself <laughs> oh okay which is not as good a way as Lindsay just recommended oh and then chris oh thanks chris chris yeah just- another one too just if you want to throw another extra 10 minutes on there's a really good one i found um a lululemon ambassador who's does some stuff with runners yeah it was 20 minutes but it's really really good too so cool. i'll try that too if you want yeah how frequently are you doing that me uh i just started this like after everything was canceled last week um yeah. i just i just decided to try something different so yeah cool um oops yeah <laughs> sorry what, what's that are you playing the video, Mom? I well, she started talking, and I didn't need to. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> <Not okay. laughs> Wait, thanks. That's, Interrupting that's a great, again. A great addition, Lindsay. No problem. Uh, I have a question about um, power. Yes. And I know we talked about power a little bit, but I I don't have a power meter on any of my bikes. Like I have a smart trainer that has a power meter in it. Yeah. And like, I just wonder if I'm missing out. I'm going to take you through a 20 minute flow, something that's um, going to somebody else. <laughs> oh no, that's me. <laughs> Is that Chris? I don't think so. <laughs> that was me. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Multitasking. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah. If I'm missing out on some 
like training benefits from not having it on my bike when I'm riding outside? Yeah, good question. So just so everybody heard that one. So I have, Lindsay has power on a smart trainer, but on none of her other bikes. And is she missing out on a training effect or benefit by, by not having on her bike? So I'll say the answer is yes and no. Uh, it's yes from the standpoint that you miss some specificity when you're out on your bike. And, you know, power really is the purest measure of effort on a bike. Um, but we can line it up with heart rate values. And assuming you have heart rate, you should have a rough idea of, hey, if I'm doing an FTP workout, my heart rate needs to be in this range. If I'm doing hill reps and there are three or, three or four minutes by the end of the interval, it should be, you know, at this, uh, this much. So I'm sure you must have some gauge uh, mm -hmm. using other ways to measure. So heart rate is a good one perceived effort is also decent. Uh, you know, we can trick ourselves either way. Um, heart rate, the, the drawback to heart rate is that it, it's, it's very, it's highly affected by things. So it's affected by heat. It's affected if we're not feeling particularly well, it's affected by fatigue. Like if you're really tired, it may be depressed. It may not come up as readily. Whereas power is power. Power doesn't care. It doesn't care if it's hot. It doesn't care if you're at altitude. It doesn't care. It just doesn't care. It's like, how hard are you pushing? Then this is your power. And where you'll probably miss it the most outdoors is in shorter, harder intervals where you, you want to have a really targeted wattage. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll miss it less potentially like on a long endurance ride power is still useful, but you can lean a little bit more on something like heart rate because it's pretty stable. And if the effort is not, you know, really high, then, you know, you can pr pretty much be in the ballpark for most of it. Um, if you're doing like, let's say you're doing all your hard intervals on the trainer anyway, like it's an hour long workout, it's five by three minutes, whatever it is. And I have power. Great. This is awesome. And now I'm going to take it out on the road and I'm going to, you know, I've got three hours, you know, endurance pace. And I know I need to be between 130 and 140 heart rate or whatever it is. Then this is still good. So again, it's not a definite answer either way. If you, but I, I, power is great. It's, it's specific. It's, uh, you know, it tells you exactly what's happening and heart rate can be a little misleading. Mm -hmm. Uh, at times, but I would say most of the time it's totally good and perceived effort also solid. I mean, you know, I always use the example, like I, I come from, I've been in this sport since the early nineties. And when I started heart rate monitors were new polar was the only provider. And even those were kind of sketchy, you know, they didn't always work. So you don't have to go back very far before we had nothing. It was like, literally, are you going hard? Are you going medium? Are you going easy? You know, that's how we measured it. And people still did really well. You know, we would do entire Ironman races and training blocks on perceived effort. And so there's something to be said for that. But as heart rate, as power becomes more accessible, more affordable, you know, the early, the first power meter I bought was 2001. It was an SRM and it cost 3,500 bucks. It's like super expensive, but it was the only game in town, you know, uh, power tap came out shortly after, but it was really fluky. It was terrible in wet weather. It was the hub based one. SRM was like the gold standard and they had the patent or the, no one could copy how they were doing it. So everybody used it, but you really paid for it. Um, and now, I mean, I don't know how many power meters there are. There's dozens and uh, they're, they're much more accurate and they're much more affordable. And so I think eventually if you can get, get into one, it's worth it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would like, if you're prioritizing financially and you know, you have a thousand bucks to spend on something that's going to make you faster. 
I would probably go with like good race wheels first, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, but if budget's no issue, then go for it. Um, you'll, you'll, you know, when you start to use those numbers, they're really useful. So, uh, yeah. what about, what about like on my mountain bike? Is yeah, I, I, I'd be less inclined. That was, that would probably be the last place I would put it, okay. even if you're racing because mountain biking look if you're climbing up a steep thing you're gonna go what you need to go to get up the thing it doesn't really matter what power you're using it's probably really relevant if you're on the world cup mountain bike tour and you want to see what the peaks and valleys are like you want to see you know if i'm you know if i have to do this climb and i'm at 600 watts to get up there what's that going to cost me and how much is it going to take to recover so maybe at the very high level, but I kind of feel like mountain biking, your, your effort is so much dictated by the terrain anyway. I don't think there's much you can do to manage it. You can't like, you're climbing a steep hill. It's not like you can decide to be 400 or 450 watts. You sort of can, but you kind of have to just get up. Mm -hmm. And whereas something like Ironman, it's, it's very steady usually. It's not, it's not like, you know, so Ironman is much more important to manage your effort appropriately and know that, Hey, if I'm at this wattage, it's going to, it's costing me this much carbohydrate fuel. It's, it's, it's costing me this much energy. And I need to know that because I'm going to be out here for 10 hours or whatever. Whereas mountain biking, you know, typically you're they're short they're fast with xterra it's what 20 or 30k it's probably an hour to an hour and a half or something you're kind of on the rivet the whole way anyway and i don't necessarily know how useful power is going to be for you in that moment um but what i will say is you know with a smart trainer you can pop your mountain bike off probably you probably ride your smart trainer on the mountain bike yes can you I don't know because it's a through axle. Oh, no, disc, disc brakes. You can't put a train, the bike oh, disc brakes on okay. the smart trainer, can you? I don't think so. I think you can, you might, I might be able to get an adapter, but. Um. Okay. Well, I know there are, you know, the, the, so are you using a smart trainer where you take the back wheel off? I, I'm pretty sure I've seen mountain bikes set up on those. Yeah, sides. I'm sure you can. I would just there have to get some adapter. adapter. So, but anyway, forget I said that where power's useful like let's say you're getting ready for an xterra mountain bike event um you know that in that event you're going to be faced with 30 second to three or four minute efforts that are pretty high right mm -hmm. like it's it really is a roller coaster of effort and now you're descending and the pressure's off your legs a little bit but it's still aggressive you have to be really aware heart rate probably doesn't come down too much on some of those descents. Uh, but where you could gain is to say like, okay, uh, maybe the set I'm gonna do is 10 by 30 seconds, like really hard. And I know that if I'm climbing some of this stuff in, in an Xterra or a mountain bike race, I'm gonna need to be four to 500 watts for that amount of time or whatever it is for you. And then, you know, you can use power on the trainer even on your road bike uh to accomplish that goal works the same energy system yeah you get on the mountain bike the position's a little different so you know but muscularly it's more or less the same so yeah i, I would if you're going to get power the last place i put it is on your mountain bike unless you were only racing mountain bikes and then maybe it'd be useful but even if if you went for a mountain bike workout I suppose like if you're doing hill reps and you're trying to hit a certain wattage, yeah, definitely. But even if you came back with an Xterra race file on like a power file for an Xterra race, it'd be all over the map. You yeah. Know? What it would tell you is your highs and lows, you know, it'd be like, Oh, you know what? You're actually, you know, hitting 600 Watts sometimes during these. So we need to make sure you're ready for that. That'd be useful, mm -hmm. but more useful, I think, on a road bike or tri bike. Mm -hmm. Again, unless unless you can, unless it's just like ah, it's all good. I'll put them on everything. 
but won't be doing that right now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I like so I have I have my time trial bike and I have a road bike and my mountain bike. So my plan is I'm just gonna keep my time trial bike on the smart trainer for now because yes. I'm not gonna be racing on it. Then I can do those specific power workout power like whatever dictated workouts on the trainer once a week or whenever when I need to, but then also go out side and ride my mountain bike for longer rides or road bike or whatever. To totally. Have both. Yeah. I think that's great. I like, that's a great way to do it. Yeah. Perfect. And, and like, as far as, as doing those specific trainer workouts, like it's nice to ride outside all the time, but do you recommend like, you know, once a week being on the trainer or twice a week or whatever, like, yeah really specific so a trainer is like obviously great bang for your buck you can typically volume wise you can about 65 to 75 percent on a trainer is the equivalent to on the road so uh what would that maybe two hours on the trainer is equivalent to the same rough load as three hours outside in terms of energy cost um where i would use a trainer even in the summer if you need to is for those short specific sets. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing like a VO2 max set is, is five by three minutes. And I really need to hit a specific wattage for these to get the, the training load that like the, the, uh, the trigger, the training stress trigger that I need. Uh, then this is really, really useful. The other place it's really useful is if you have somewhere with good resistance. So uh, if you're gonna do those shorter, harder intervals, it always has to be somewhere where resistance is a guarantee and it's constant and you're going to get that on a trainer and you're going to get that on a hill and anywhere else is tough. Like think if you go out and do five by three minutes on, you know, rolly terrain or flat, perfectly flat is fine. But even that you kind of run out of resistance a little bit, whereas on a hill, it's a guarantee. So I think for those, that's your most useful place to have a, a trainer and I would encourage you to do it. it. You'll be super strong. You can, you can bang out that workout specifically to what you need uh, without any, without any issue. It's just really efficient way to get the work done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. So, but then the long stuff, yeah, get outside, you know, but you'll see, I mean, like, I, I use Lionel as an example for a lot of things because I, I think he's just kind of hardcore and he's got a pretty cool attitude about stuff. That guy spends like a huge amount of time on the trainer and I can guarantee he's doing that uh, for a couple of reasons. Maybe some, I don't know, maybe safety's one for him, who knows. But, uh, but one of them's probably that he just, he has the wattage numbers he wants to hit and on the trainer, he can do it without issue. You know, on the road, it's fluky. Maybe he has uh, the right hill to do it. But on the road, maybe you have a headwind or a tailwind and it's affecting things or you, there's stop signs and traffic lights and I don't know, you know, you get a flat. I don't know. Like he just probably likes to be so regimented. Mm -hmm. But that also takes a pretty unique mental state to be able to spend three to five hours on the thing. Oh God. yeah. Like any two and a half hours is like my limit after that. I start to just like lose it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a harder place to spend time. Yeah. But you also do mentally toughen up to that as well. Yeah. Again, it's like anything. I, I remember my first trainer rides of the year. They're like the open water swims. You're like, ah, oh, it's gotta be 20 minutes and it's like 90 seconds. And you're like, <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a weird thing. We mentally kind of get over it. And then, yeah. Through a winter of training on the trainer, you know, two or three hours was never a problem. Just kind of went by. So, yeah. And so, yeah, like over the winter, most of the, the longest ride really I would do on the trainer would be like two and a half to 245. Yeah. Um, but like I, I, don't didn't have any long Ironmans on the on my schedule um would you if you were training like for an Ironman would you go longer than that or would I think if you're if you're getting ready for an Ironman and the trainer is your only option right 
Okay. You have to, I think. I think two and a half to three on a trainer to get ready for Ironman is a little too short. Like I, I think I'd be pushing people up around three and a half to five. And again, if you're equating that to outdoors, about 65, 75%, let's say 70%. So you need to add 30%. So, you know, a four hour ride is probably the equivalent of somebody do math for me. Is that about six, five or six? Which is about right, right? Like you're, most people are going to be riding between five and seven hours. And, uh, you know, like the, the thing with the, that endurance mileage is maybe the toughest thing to get indoors because of the mental side of it. Um, one of the channel, I work with a guy in Toronto and he can, he never rides outside and his, his mental tolerance for, for trainer rides is about three hours. And that's our most challenging thing is I, it's really hard to get, he works too. So he's got a nine to five job and this is tricky. Uh, but he's also a pro. So he's competing against, he's competing at his competition is in Arizona, probably riding 15 to 20 hours a week. Right. And to do that would require five, three hour training trainer rides a week. Like this is like impossible for the guy. He just doesn't, he doesn't have the space for it. Uh, like in his life. Mm -hmm. So he misses out on this massive aerobic component you get by being able to do that. Um, you know, even half the best half Ironman, Ironman athletes on the planet, my guess would be uh, at least 10 hours on the bike a week, at least, at least. And usually they're living in cl climates where they can do it outdoors. So mentally it's easier, but then if you're Lionel, you're doing it, whatever. I mean, that guy's notorious for four to six hour trainer rides, right? On your base in your basement in Windsor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Win winter's also a factor, but he's in Arizona. I wonder if he's stuck there. Or I wonder how he's still there unless he has U U.S. citizenship or maybe he married somebody from the U.S. But he seems to still be there, which surprises me. I, I think as long as you didn't leave and try and come back. True. Like, you, like they can't find you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's like training such a tricky thing. Cause there's, there's never one right answer, you know, everybody's different. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that the real secret is to figure out what works for you, figure out a good rhythm and then stick to that and be super consistent with it. And, you know, given where you live, I don't know what your situation's like for, uh, you know, good hill workouts or, whatever, but I think for the harder stuff, trainer might be your best bet, you know, for shorter, harder intervals. Mm -hmm. And then on the longer stuff, yeah, get lost on your mountain bike or road bike and explore and have fun and keep it pretty organic. Um, but have some specificity in the week where you're like, okay, I really nail this one. These are my wattage ranges. I need to really hit this one and then do that inside. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Oh, Andy, you're on mute, I think. Andy, how you doing? There we go. I'm good. I, that's a rookie move there, yeah. <laughs> or an old man, old man move. Uh, just on this thing about power. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating thing to me because... Um, you know, I started these in like 82 and there was no power. You just rode, you had like eight speed bikes and, and, um, and that, but, um, what I would say is that what I learned by when I got to power was how in tune I was with my body and my effort levels yeah. and how, how I was feeling. And that's really important because if you get to a race and your technology goes bad on you rather than freaking out because you're not getting data that you've been relying on you you just go and you know that mentally you can do that because you're you're really in tune with what your body is telling you and, and the feedback it's giving 
Yeah. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really, um, uh, the, the power thing, sometimes I have one and I know when, when you were setting up those hill workouts for me, uh, for Kona a couple of years ago, lots of times I would go do them, but I wouldn't look at the data while I was doing the workout. Yeah. And then when, when I got home and looked at it, I was comparing my mental, um, recap of my effort and my workout to the data. And it's pretty, I was, it was pretty consistent, you know, uh, you're, you're just in tune with, with what's going on. Um, but the couple of sessions a week where you're really doing the specific, that word you use, Jasper, specificity, specificity. Um, <laughs> it is, is just ideal. And I, I wish I had some of that back in the eighties. Um, uh, because they're just awesome to do. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing about the length of the workouts on the trainer, uh, mentally, they're, they're like everybody struggles with that. Um, what I what I found with with some of them is that uh, sometimes I'd be scheduled for like a three hour training ride, and you kind of go, oh man, that's a long, that's a long time. But what I would do to kind of build that up mentally was once I got to three hours, I would just try to go another 10 or 15 or minutes, which would often turn into half an hour. So all of a sudden you've broken through a barrier um, time-wise and in your head. Mm -hmm. And so then the next time you go back the three hours saying, oh yeah, that's, that's, I, I can go way longer than that. Yeah. And I, th I think mentally that is, uh, that is huge. It's, um, I think the longest I went on the trainer was 520 or 515 one Friday night there a couple of summers ago, um, had to, had to fit it in and I just had to do it. And so don't underestimate your ability to stay on the trainer um for a, for a long time but you're certainly not going to go from two hours to five hours so you you kind of want to pick out some some barriers or or things humps that you can get over and say okay well the next time i go to do this um i've done this before so it gives you some some um history and your body uh, your body listens to that so totally yeah that's a really great point, Andy. And as it's sort of like everything in terms of progressing your way up there, you know, and, and your mental threshold for the length of things goes up. I, I, I said, talked about the open water swimming too. I always found that coming from a pool to open water around this time of year, you know, I get in and, and I swim and be like, ah, oh, it's probably like 15 minutes and it's like 90 seconds. And you're like, because you're so used to turning every 25 or every 50. So there's something to engage your brain. But I found like it wouldn't take long before I could just bang out an hour straight without any issue in open water. And it was all, you know, part of it was physical because it's a little bit different, uh, but mostly mental. It's just your mental tolerance for something really does. You get a mental strength from it, but you have to kind of do it. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question, Jazzy. Lindsay kind of alluded to it, but if you have the luxury of a road bike and a TT bike at this time, is it best to park the TT bike and get on the road bike or? Yeah, like that's a, that's a really good question. And uh, I think, it, again, you, you got to look down the line. So usually when people are within 10 to 12 weeks of uh, an Ironman, like I think the more time you can spend on the bike, you're going to race on the better just because there's a muscular changes and that position's different. And so you want to really get comfortable and good in that position. Um, but yeah, right now, given the state of things, like I would spend more time on my road bike and through the winter, I used to spend almost exclusively my time on the road bike. And then when, when I was within a certain window of a race then i would introduce the time trial bike but i like road bikes i mean they're more comfortable they're safer 
I think, you know, your hands are always covering the brakes, whatever position they're in, whereas time trial bike, not always. They give you more freedom to ride with people, like it's safer to ride in groups. And so, yeah, I'm all, you know, in favor of being on the road bike for so many reasons uh, until, you know, your window is, is closing to get really good on the time trial bike. But okay. yeah, there's no issue. Like, I think, you know, I think it's great if you have a couple of bikes and you can spend time on, on that different position. Now, again, there is a muscle specificity component. You're in a different position. Uh, it, it, things do work a little differently. You have to get fit in the position you want to race in. Um, but it's close enough that if you spend all winter on a road bike and then move to a TT bike six to 12 weeks before you should be fine. Okay. For sure. Yeah. It's more fun too. I, I mean, I don't know. Some people like being on their TT bike all the time, but I always found road bikes just, I felt freer. I, you know, just felt better for climbing and cornering and all these other things. So, yeah. And I just like the ease of like, oh, if the weather's crap, my bike's already on the trainer. I can hop on my time trial bike or, or, you know, my road bike. Yeah. Trip, so. Yeah. I like that strategy. I used to do the same thing actually. So in the winter I'd have my TT bike always set up on the trainer, ready to go. So there was no resistance for me to have to get on that thing. I could just get dressed and go. I didn't have to take it off. Um, and then outdoor was almost exclusively on like a winter road bike. Um, and so that's another way I used to do it. Like, yeah, I would, I would always be spending a bit of time on my time trial bike even through the winters because it was the one on my trainer and it ultimately made that transition back to it much easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And now of course you also need a gravel bike mm -hmm. and <laughs> a mountain bike and a single gear fixie for getting around town. And <laughs> I totally want to get a gravel bike. It looks so much fun. And like it's, three times this week, I've ridden to like the end of the pavement. And then I was like, ah, I need a different bike to keep going. Yeah, it does look <laughs> fun. I, I kind of want one too, to be honest. Be fun to I just explore. bought a new road bike to replace the one that got stolen. So I'm like, I can't buy another yeah. one because it's just not allowed. <laughs> can you put gravel tires? I think, uh, did I ask you that, Lindsay? Can I put, can I put gravel tires on my road bike? Um, so the, I, I think the limiting factor would be rim size. Yeah. What if I just got a different set of wheels? Cause it's got disc brakes. Yeah. I, I'm not technically like, there has yeah. to be enough. I asked this cause I was thinking about doing this when I got my bike and there has to be enough clearance for, okay. for the wheel. And then mm -hmm. the other thing is that apparently the gravel bikes are like a little bit more rigid than mm -hmm like the mm -hmm. carbon road bike so that you can like, you know, withstand the thing. So they're sort of interchangeable, but not quite like the guy, when I was buying one actually sort of said the more like a reasonable thing to do would be to get the gravel bike and then put slick tires on it and mm -hmm. ride it like a road bike. But then I felt weird about buying a, like dropping five grand on a bike for something I'd like never tried before. So I ended up going like the other way, but yeah, we had like long discussions about this. Mm. Uh, well, I think I think maybe it would depend on like what kind of gravel you want to ride. Like if you're be in in like gnarly, like hardcore, really bad back roads, then might be. I don't think so. Um, I, kept, I kept thinking in here in Halliburton. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that. I would talk to somebody at a shop. Mm -hmm. That's a question. So. You know, Jeremy, who pops in here, does mm. our sessions, like he is, he has made it explicitly clear to me. And I think on the sessions, he's like, use me as your equipment guy. If anybody has equipment questions, like, so I'll, I'll send an email to him and copy you, Joanne. Okay. And, and uh, then he can answer that question, um, you know, from a, from a guy who had a bike shop. <laughs> perfect thank you yeah perspective you'll know good you'll know. good stuff yeah yeah 
Guys, thanks for the chat. I have to jump off because I have to go to work. So. Uh, thanks. Thanks for <laughs> jumping in, Kelly. Bye, okay. Kelly. Thanks for the info. Bye, guys. Good see ya. Bye. Bye. Um, I have to jump too because my daughter needs the computer for uh, her, a Zoom call. <laughs> yeah. Cute. Um, but this uh, is great. And, you know, I never hesitate to fire questions, you know, our way if you have any. Um, but this was good. I was a little worried. I, I at about 7.59, I was like, oh, I don't think anybody's coming. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, everybody popped up. Boom. <laughs> good. Uh, These are great, Jess. Right. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. That's great, you guys. Thanks so much for jumping on. It's always good to see you.